Good morning. I'm reading to you this morning from Ecclesiastes chapter 3 verse 16 to chapter 4 verse 3. And I saw something else under the sun. In the place of judgment, wickedness was there. In the place of justice, wickedness was there. I said to myself, God will bring judgment both to the righteous and the wicked, for there will be time for every activity, a time to judge every deed. I also said to myself, as for humans, God tests them so that they may see that they are like the animals. Surely the fate of human beings is like that of the animals. The same fate awaits them both. As one dies, so dies the other. All have the same breath. Humans have no advantage over animals. Everything is meaningless. All go to the same place. All come from dust and to dust all return. Who knows if the human spirit rises upwards and the animal spirit goes down into the earth. So I saw that there is nothing better for a person than to enjoy their work because that is their lot. For who can bring them to see what will happen after them? Again, I looked and I saw all the oppression that was taking place under the sun. I saw the tears of the oppressed and they have no comforter. Power was on the side of their oppressors and they have no comforter. And I declared that the dead who have already died are happier than the living who are still alive. But better than both is the one who has never been born, who has not seen the evil that is done under the sun. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Helen. Let's pray together as we come to God's word. And Father, I, I thank you that you feed us through your word. And Lord, may we taste and see your goodness this morning as we hear your word and we hear your voice through your word. Unblock our ears, soften our hearts and may your word nourish us, we pray, in the name of Jesus. Amen. Isaiza is a Uyghur from the northeastern region of China called Xinjiang. And she now lives with 50,000 other Uyghurs in Turkey, having fled China in 2018 after her husband was arrested. From 2016 onwards, all Uyghurs were denied passports and the right to travel to other countries. Aziza, fearing she would be rounded up next, made the heartbreaking Sophie's Choice decision to escape. She fled with two of her children who still had passports but had to leave behind her seven-year-old daughter with neighbours because she didn't have a passport for her and was banned from getting one. Her daughter was soon taken by the government to an orphanage. Aziza knows she will never see her daughter or her husband again. The reporter who's made known her story says she sits in agony, fingering the one tiny picture she has left of her little girl. All photos and videos were removed from her phone as her number was requ requisitioned back in China. Where is justice? As we continue to read through Ecclesiastes, the teacher now turns his mind to the issues of injustice. And thank you to all those who have sent their areas of injustice through to us. And this is the words that you sent through. So let's just have a look at the things that you've raised as issues of injustice 
around our world. And if you know word clouds, the bigger words are ones that have been repeated many times. So poverty was the most common answer that was given. Uh, you'll see that there's quite a few words that are similar. So they, they've appeared smaller, but they're on the same theme, particularly the word racial, which appears, or race, appears in a few areas. And some countries are named there, countries where injustice is taking place. And before we get on our high horse, we notice the United Kingdom is one place that's been named there as well. The teacher highlights two areas where injustice happens. And we'll just have a look. First of all, it says in verse 16, and I saw something else under the sun in the place of judgment, wickedness was there. In the place of justice, wickedness was there. What he's saying here is that there is corruption in the courts. The courts are bent, they're rotten. Where judgment should take place and all wrongs be righted, it's not happening. In the place of judgment, wickedness was there. The guilty are getting off scot-free. And where there should be justice, where the innocent should be protected and defended and vindicated, they are wrongly and unjustly treated. Some of us may remember the footage of the trial a few years ago of three Sunday school teachers in Indonesia, Rebecca and two colleagues. And, and they were on trial for false charges of blasphemy. And, and the pictures which Open Doors released were, uh, showed huge pressure placed on the judges by hostile crowds, both outside the courtroom and inside the court itself. And you can see a link on our MailChimp to, to that footage. Unsurprisingly, the judges returned a guilty verdict. In the place of justice, wickedness was there. Although I don't know all the details, only last month in Russia, we saw opposition leader Alexei Navalny sentenced to two and a half years for breaking the terms of a suspended sentence by failing to check in with Russia's prison service whilst he was in Germany, recovering from a near fatal poisoning attack in August, which is widely believed to be linked to President Putin. In the place of justice, wickedness was there. And then the, the teacher sees, uh, at the, towards the end of the passage, he sees the issue of the whole oppression that takes place in the world. Oppression is rife. And he says this in chapter 4, verse 1, Again, I looked and saw all the, all the oppression that was taking place under the sun. I saw the tears of the oppressed, and they have no comforter. Power was on the side of their oppressors, and they have no comforter. Where is justice, he says. And it, it doesn't take long for us to think of examples of oppression where those with power call the shots, they do what they like, and those being oppressed are powerless. We might think here of people groups like the Uyghurs or the Rohingyas in Myanmar or perhaps the Christians amongst the Rohingya people. Most of the Rohingyas are Muslims but the Christians are persecuted by other Rohingyas and the Rohingyas are persecuted by, by the, the state. Uh, so the Christian Rohingyas are at the bottom of the pile. Or we might think in terms of wider issues, the powerlessness of the poorest in our world to receive vaccination against the virus. Or the powerlessness of those living in countries most at risk to climate change, who are at least able to do anything about it as richer countries continue to pursue their own economic interests. Power is on the side of the oppressors. Or we could think in individual terms, how the most vulnerable are sometimes neglected, forgotten or overlooked. Several years ago, the horrific case of Peter Conley, Baby P, highlighted the failings of those who had power to intervene and should have protected. Aged just 17 months, he died after suffering over 50 injuries during an eight-month period. And healthcare professional after healthcare professional failed to protect him. I saw the tears of the oppressed and they have no comforter. 
Or we could think of Christians persecuted for their faith, such as Lana, an Egyptian girl, raised in a devout Muslim home, who at 19 years old became a Christian and was subsequently beaten by her father and then forbidden to sit with her family at mealtimes by her mother and then thrown out of the family home and then kidnapped and beaten until she was unconscious. I saw the tears of the oppressed. They have no comforter. Power was on the side of their oppressors. The teacher raises issues that are still issues around our world today. He raises issues of injustice in the courts and of the power of the oppressors and the powerlessness of those being oppressed. But with such justices in mind, the teacher then recalls what he probably learnt about God as a child, that God would bring justice. And he writes this in verse 17, I said to myself, God will bring into judgment both the righteous and the wicked, for there will be a time for every activity, a time to judge every deed. It's a statement of faith, speaking to his feelings of despair. And, and this idea of God's justice is thoroughly steeped in Israel's theology. God will judge the righteous and the wicked. God looks out for the vulnerable, the orphan, the widow, the foreigner. He hears their cry. He is passionately concerned about justice. This is the story of the Old Testament, the God that is revealed to us. And the idea developed over time of a coming day of judgment, the day of the Lord which the prophets Isaiah and Joel and Amos and Obadiah and Zephaniah and Zechariah talked about, a day when God would call all actions to account. And the New Testament picks that up and says this will happen when Jesus returns, that there will be this day of judgment, the day of the Lord, when all wrongs will be righted. Now, whether the teacher had this idea, we're not sure when Ecclesiastes was written, whether he, he knew this idea of the day of the Lord or not, he knows, probably from childhood, from all that he's been taught, that God will bring judgment and justice. And so for a brief moment, he finds comfort as he writes these words in verse 17. Interestingly, in the New Testament, the, the word judgment, and, and most frequently translated judgment, is in a few places also translated justice. And Stephen said to me just this week that, that when we think of the, uh, the idea, the day of judgment, then actually we could be thinking of the day of justice. The two ideas are intricately linked, where God's purposes are fully realised and justice is finally established. This is what we look forward to. Now the teacher finds relief at this thought, but his relief very quickly disappears. For this reason, that he, he sees that death renders judgment useless. Death renders judgment useless. And he writes these words, this is verses 18. He says, I said also to myself, as for humans, God tests them so that they may see that they're like animals. Surely the fate of human beings is like that of the animals. The same fate awaits them both. As one dies, so dies the other. All have the same breath. Humans have no advantage over the animals. Everything is meaningless. All co go to the same place. All come from dust, and to dust all return. Who knows if the human spirit rises upward, and if the spirit of the animals goes down. His argument is this. He looks around. He sees nothing beyond death. And if death is final, then justice will not be served. It cannot be achieved. We are, he thinks, after all, like animals, made of the same stuff, dust. We go into the same place. From dust we come and from dust we re and to dust we return. And the teacher appears to have no confidence in any life after this one, or reward for the faithful, or justice for those who have suffered injustice because of this. As it says in verse 21, who knows if the human spirit rises upward? and as the spirit of the animal goes down into the earth. And he concludes because of this, as he's done several times, with this statement, it is better than, there is nothing better. I saw 
that there is nothing better for a person than to enjoy their work, because that is their lot. For who can bring them to see what will happen after them? The best we can hope for, he says, if there is nothing beyond this life, and if justice is not served, is to enjoy what we do if God allows us, because there's no more that we can manage. Our passage this morning again invites us to think about what the teacher puts out there to ponder and to reflect on it. The teacher doesn't always speak what is true, but they create space for us to explore our own thoughts and ideas around this and to search and to seek for meaning and for answers. And I'd say I, I feel there are two truths that the speak, speaker, the teacher speaks this morning. I think first of all, when he declares God as a God of justice, he declares something that is absolutely true. God is not ambivalent to the plight of those oppressed by others, to the cry of those exploited, to the injustices suffered over and over again in our world. Whether it's the vilification of a certain people group like the Huyghurs or the Rohingya or individuals like Baby P or the Egyptian girl Lana who became a Christian, God hears every cry. He sees every deed. He sees every injustice. And he will call to account all for what they have done to others. And he'll call us to account for the injustices we have done. And secondly, I think the teacher is also correct, that if death is the end, then actually there isn't justice. I think that's a true statement. If death is the end, then justice cannot be achieved. If we're no more than animals, if we merely return to the dust, there is no justice for those whose lives are destroyed by others. But where the teacher, I think, is wrong is that he doesn't know that God will bring justice beyond our death. That our spirits do indeed rise up to God and that death is not the final word. And we know as Christians this is true because of our Lord Jesus, because he conquered death. For those who have suffered injustice at the hand of others, God will bring his justice on that day when Jesus returns. And Paul writes to the Corinthians, Paul who suffered at the hands of others, horrendous things at times, horrendous punishments because of his faith in Jesus. He, he writes these words, our light and momentary troubles are achieving for us an eternal glory that far outweighs them all. I, I might be suffering injustice here and now, but actually God will correct this. There is an eternal glory where God will bring his reward. Or if we read in Revelation, we read about the souls of those under the altar crying out for justice in chapter 6. How long, O Lord, until you judge the inhabitants of the earth and avenge our blood? What this means, if God is going to bring this day of judgment, this day of justice, what this means for us is that it is worth fighting for justice here and now. That everything isn't futile, everything isn't in vain, actually there is a point and a purpose that even when it might be difficult to strive for justice and we might not see it fully achieved, it is still worth pursuing because one day God will right all wrongs. Nothing escapes his notice and he will reward the righteous and he will punish the wicked. Our pursuit of justice is not in vain, it's not futile, it will not be forgotten. And all those words that we put up on the word cloud, actually those are areas where we can fight for justice here and now, knowing that ultimately God will bring all to account for injustice. The Egyptian girl I mentioned earlier, Lana, who was rejected by her family because of her Christian faith. She said these words as she continued to face intense hostility. She said, I'm in real danger. I trust God because he is alive. My comfort is that it is only a short time I'm spending here on earth, but there will be a long time that I'll spend with him. We know there will come a time when there will be no more sorrow or suffering. This is our hope in the Lord Jesus. God is just and the day of judgment will be a day of justice when God will call all things to account and set right all wrongs.
And our prayer is Maranatha. It's a prayer of the early church, which means come, Lord Jesus, come. Come and bring your judgment. Come and bring your justice. Come and bring your kingdom fully on the earth as it is in heaven. And we work for justice now, knowing that there is justice in the end, because God will bring it about.